Think about the last time you went grocery shopping. You might have noticed that it's easy to move your cart in the beginning. But once your cart is full, you have to push a lot harder to get it moving. Why do you think that is? You might think that there's a bigger friction force on the full cart, which is acting against you, but that's not the reason. Not only is it harder to get the cart moving, it's also harder to slow down and stop. You might have also noticed that it's easy to turn the cart when it's empty. But when it's full, it wants to keep going straight, and it takes a lot of force to turn it. So what's going on? Clearly, the only difference is how much stuff is in the cart. So how do we describe that stuff in physics, and how would Newton explain this scenario? Newton's second law of motion says that the net force acting on an object is equal to its mass multiplied by its acceleration, so F net equals ma. This law is basically just this equation using words, and the little arrows mean that the force and the acceleration are vectors, and we need to consider their direction. So let's rewrite this law with the equation up front, and we'll add this sentence. The acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. So let's take a closer look at this equation. Sigma f is the net force acting on an object, m is the mass of the object, and a is the acceleration of the object. The net force and the acceleration are vectors, which means they have a magnitude and a direction. Let's go through each one. In a previous video, we learned that the net force acting on an object is the total, or the sum, of all the forces acting on it. And forces are vectors, so the net force depends on the magnitudes and the directions of the forces. We can write net force as F net, or as sigma F, which means the sum of the forces. And the SI unit for force is a Newton, capital N, which is equal to 1 kilogram meter per second squared. So in this example, there's only one force acting on the object, so that's also the net force, 10 newtons to the right. In this example, the net force is 10 newtons minus 10 newtons, which is 0 newtons. The forces have the same magnitude, and they act in opposite directions, so they cancel out. In this example, the net force is 15 newtons minus 10 newtons, which is 5 newtons to the left. The next thing we need to talk about is mass. An object's mass can be thought of as a measure of the object's inertia, which is its resistance to a change in its state of motion. That'll make more sense as we go along, but if you're new to the concept of mass, it might help to think of it as the weight of an object. That's because an object's mass is proportional to its weight, so heavier objects have more mass. And the SI unit for mass is the kilogram, or lowercase kg. It's very important to note that mass and weight are two different things. Mass is an intrinsic property of an object, and weight is the amount of gravitational force on the object. This book always has the same mass of 2 kilograms, whether it's on Earth, on the Moon, or on Mars. But the weight of the book will change depending on the strength of the planet's gravity. So it weighs less on the Moon, but its mass is still 2 kilograms. We'll learn more about weight in another lesson. For now, it's more important to think about mass as the inertia of an object. Let's look at the two shopping carts again. The full cart has a greater mass than the empty cart, so it has more inertia. When you have to push harder to move the full cart, what you're experiencing is the cart's inertia, which is described in Newton's first law of motion. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion will continue moving in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted on by a net force. The thing we're adding now is that an object with more mass and inertia wants to remain at rest more than an object with less mass and inertia. It's harder to get it moving. It has more resistance to a change in its state of motion. Once the carts are moving, the cart with more mass and inertia wants to keep moving more than the cart with less mass and inertia. It's harder to slow down, 
it has more resistance to a change in its current state of motion. We'll use numbers to describe this stuff in a minute, but that's how we can think of mass and inertia as a concept. The last part in the equation is acceleration. An object's acceleration is just its change in velocity divided by time, which we covered in kinematics. Acceleration also shows up in a few other kinematic equations, and the SI unit for acceleration is meters per second squared. It's important to remember that acceleration is a vector, so acceleration can mean an object is speeding up, slowing down, or changing direction. Here's a quick example. The top car speeds up from 10 meters per second to 16 meters per second over 2 seconds. So its acceleration is 3 meters per second squared to the right. The bottom car slows down from 10 meters per second to 4 meters per second over 2 seconds. So its acceleration is negative 3 meters per second squared, or 3 meters per second squared to the left. Again, acceleration doesn't mean speeding up, it means any change in velocity over time. So let's put these things together. This box has a mass of 3 kilograms. There's a 10 newton force acting to the right, and a 4 newton force acting to the left. So the net force on the box is 6 newtons to the right. Newton's second law of motion says that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So the acceleration of the box is the net force divided by the mass, which is 6 newtons divided by 3 kilograms, which gives us 2 meters per second squared. So the net force on this box causes it to accelerate in that direction. And the net force, the mass, and the acceleration are related using this equation. This is where we get the unit of newtons. The force in newtons is equal to the mass in kilograms times the acceleration in meters per second squared. This was a simple example, but this equation is the foundation for a lot of physics, and we're going to use it in different ways throughout the course. Let's start by applying it to the shopping cart example. The empty cart has a mass of 20 kilograms, and the full cart has a mass of 40 kilograms. Each cart is being pushed to the right, and we'll say that the net force on each one is 80 newtons. Pause the video and try to answer these questions. What will happen to each cart, and how will they move or not move? Which cart will accelerate faster? And try to calculate the acceleration of each cart. We can rearrange this equation so the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. For the empty cart, we plug in 80 newtons for the net force and 20 kilograms for the mass, and we get 4 meters per second squared for the acceleration of the empty cart. For the full cart, we plug in 80 newtons for the net force and 40 kilograms for the mass, and we get 2 meters per second squared for the acceleration of the full cart. So the carts have the same net force to the right, which causes them to accelerate in that direction. But notice that the full cart has twice the mass, so it has half the acceleration. This is the mathematical way to describe why the full cart feels harder to push. If you apply the same force to both carts, the full cart accelerates slower, and it takes longer to speed up because it has more mass and more inertia. Let's think of it another way. What net force do you need to apply to the full cart so that it has the same acceleration as the empty cart? which is 4 meters per second squared. You might have been able to just think it through and realize that the full cart has twice the mass, so it needs twice the net force to get the same acceleration. So the net force would have to be 160 newtons. We can also calculate it using Newton's second law. If we plug in 40 kilograms for the mass and 4 meters per second squared for the acceleration, we multiply them together to get 160 newtons for the net force. So, we have to push the full cart with more force if we want it to accelerate at the same rate as the empty cart. 
But there's three important things to remember about this equation in Newton's second law. First, all that matters is the net force on the object. So let's say that two people are pulling on the bottom cart in opposite directions, with two different forces. Neither of those individual forces is equal to mass times acceleration. We have to use the net force, which in this case is 100 minus 20, or 80 newtons to the right. That 80 newton net force is what we use in this equation. So even though these two carts have different forces acting on them, they have the same net force, and they have the same mass, so they have the same acceleration. The next thing to remember is that the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. So if these two forces were switched, and the net force was 80 newtons to the left, this bottom cart would accelerate to the left. And third, this equation relates the net force to the acceleration. It doesn't say anything about the velocity of the object. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So the change in velocity is related to the force, but not the velocity itself. For example, let's say the top cart is at rest, and the bottom cart is moving with a constant speed of 3 meters per second. Let's ignore friction and assume the net force on each cart is zero. The bottom cart keeps moving because of its inertia, from Newton's first law of motion. Since the net force on each cart is zero, the acceleration of each cart is zero. The net force doesn't tell us anything about the actual velocity of the cart. It only tells us how the velocity is changing, which is the acceleration. The net force is zero, so the velocity doesn't change. But Newton's second law doesn't tell us how fast it's currently moving. We would need more information to figure that out. Even if the carts have the same net force and acceleration, they might have had different initial speeds, so we can't figure out how fast they're moving at a given time just using Newton's second law. That only gives us the acceleration, and then we can use kinematics to figure out its velocity or position at a certain time. So that's how we can use Newton's second law to calculate things. Since we use this equation a lot, it helps to have a strong intuition for how the variables are related. Like any equation, we can rearrange this in different ways. This first form is probably the best way to think about mass and inertia. If you apply a net force to an object and measure its acceleration, you can calculate the object's mass. If it accelerates faster, the mass must be smaller. And if it accelerates slower, the mass must be greater. Remember, the left and right side of an equation have to be equal, so a change to one side has to be reflected on the other side. If the denominator is smaller, then we're dividing the net force by a smaller number, and the fraction is bigger, so the left side also has to be bigger. If we divide the net force by a bigger number, then the fraction is smaller, so the left side is also smaller. This other form makes it easier to calculate the acceleration, if we know the net force and the mass. If the net force is constant and we increase the mass, the acceleration will decrease. If we decrease the mass, the acceleration will increase. And let's look at the original equation. If we keep the mass constant and we increase the net force, the acceleration will also increase. If we decrease the net force, the acceleration will decrease. Or, if we keep the acceleration constant and increase the net force, the mass must be greater. And if we have a smaller net force, but the same acceleration, the mass must be smaller. Let's see what this looks like using numbers. We'll go through this quickly, so feel free to pause at any point to look at the math. Here, we have a 1 newton net force acting on a 1 kilogram box, so it accelerates at 1 meter per second squared. If we keep the same mass, but double the net force, then we also double the acceleration. Or we can say, if we have twice the acceleration, then we must have twice the net force. If we have half the net force, then we get half the acceleration. If the net force is the same, but the object has twice the mass, then it'll have half the acceleration.
and if the object has half the mass, it has twice the acceleration. Now let's keep the acceleration the same. If we have twice the mass, then we also need twice the net force. And if we have half the mass, we only need half the net force. So that's Newton's second law of motion. We mentioned before that this basically replaces Newton's first law. So what does that mean? Newton's first law says that an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by a net force. If we take Newton's second law equation and plug in zero net force, that means the acceleration must be zero. The mass will never be zero for things that we study in this course. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So if the acceleration is zero, that means the change in velocity is zero, so the velocity is constant if there's zero net force. If an object is at rest, its velocity is zero meters per second, but it's a constant zero meters per second. The velocity doesn't change, and it remains at rest. If there is a net force, then there's also acceleration, so the velocity changes, and the object does not remain at rest. If an object is moving, and there's zero net force, then there's zero acceleration, and the velocity is constant. The object moves in a straight line at a constant speed if there's no net force. Again, if there is a net force, then there's acceleration, so the velocity changes. We're going to refer to Newton's second law a lot more than the first law, because it lets us calculate things, and it covers things conceptually. If there's no net force, the acceleration is zero, so the velocity is constant. If there is a net force, then there is acceleration, so the velocity changes. Newton's second law of motion is one of the connections between dynamics and kinematics. The left side is the sum of all the forces that are acting on the object, and it'll include the equations and variables for different types of forces. The right side tells us the acceleration of the object, which we can use with the kinematic equations to study its motion. A problem might give us the motion and ask us to figure out the forces. Or it might give us the forces and ask us a question about the motion. And sometimes it'll be a combination of both. We're going to use this equation a lot, and we'll see how useful it is throughout the rest of the course. In the next video, we'll learn how to draw free body diagrams and use Newton's second law in two dimensions, the x direction and the y direction. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.